What do you think is the most useful thing that microbes have done for us or will be able to do? Ooh. <laughs> um, the single most useful thing? Um, that's a really hard question. <laughs> I think it changes over time, like we say. If we go back to my, one of my last points um, about antimicrobial resistance, the fact that microbes had such an impact on society in as far back as just the Second World War, where their use to create penicillin would have been one of the many things, many factors that helped swing the war towards, um, the winning of the war towards uh, th this way. Um, yet still, that ability to evolve and share genetic information is something that now is a negative. So, there, is, there isn't one thing, I don't think. It's, there's too many things. From the beginning of civilization, when we used them solely for um, preservation and uh, for fun through uh, brewing and baking, up to today, where we now have a big focus on using them for healthcare and improving healthcare. They can't, I don't think there is one thing. But I do believe, um, as I said earlier on, that fermentation and civilization are inseparable. Thank you. Um, do you see any potential risks with the idea that um, a virus could be used as a vector to deliver a gene? I mean, could the virus get into the wrong thing and produce some disastrous consequences, or is that just science fiction? <laughs> um, so it, it's, it's a little bit of both. Um, there are... No risk with the therapy itself, because they use um, attenuated viruses that have no ability to cause disease, but they do have the ability to invade cells. So that is one of the beauties of it. But as we've already discussed, um, viruses do have the ability to drift, antigenic drift. So you can have the ability, they do have the ability to kind of change and mutate as they're reproduced. It's going to be one of those things whereby the checking of the virus will happen prior to it in, uh, given to the patient. So as long as the quality assurance within a process, which is a big thing within biochemical engineering, um, is good enough, there should be no health risks. Great. We'll take the next question from the front, please. Thanks so much. That was a great talk. I have a question about fermentation in food. You gave some really good examples of how it's being used, but do you as a researcher in this field get a lot of kind of molecular gastronomy chefs and stuff emailing you to ask you about things they can do in their food labs? Or have you ever <laughs> been to any of those to help them out? Because it strikes me that you've got a lot of chefs who are really trying to do this and a lot of experts like you who really know about it. Um, so an easy answer to that is no. Um, but a, a better answer is that uh, I haven't really spoken to any. So as a department, um, people, those of us who are kind of outward facing, who like to go and talk to people about and find out information about what other people do, who are within kind of the general field, uh, do so. And we, I talk to a lot of microbrewers, um, uh, also spoken to a lot of kind of bakers who are really interested in the different, uh, fl different flora they use to create bread and how it affects the taste. Um, brewing. Uh, some of the people who do brewing are literally yeast geniuses. They know so much about yeast and how a different yeast will have a different flavour impact on a beer. Because obviously beer has only got four ingredients, yet there are thousands of different types of beer. Um, and it's just because you can kind of vary the ratios of some of the ingredients or switch the yeast out and it will change the, the flavour profile completely. So... Um, we do talk, uh, but it's more from a learning perspective than it is from a uh, kind of giving knowledge perspective. I don't think just because I work in university and I f do fermentations all the time that I know everything. Uh, I know I know everything. No, I, <laughs> I don't know everything. So I like to go out and find out what other people are doing um, kind of within the same space. Great. Can we take a question from the balcony, please? How long do you think it will be until we can... Cure hemophilia. Oh, 
That's a good question. Um, so hemophilia isn't as simple as cystic fibrosis. And that's because cystic fibrosis has one specific target, which is the lungs. Um, so haemophilia probably would be easier to, easier to cure by, via genome editing, which is ethically bad, um, because then you get into the area where you're looking for kind of designer babies um, and removing like, any unwanted things from babies, if that's, which sounds, well, it sounds as bad as it is. I think that the only real difficulty is for gene therapy, which is what you'd need to do to cure hemophilia, is the delivery of the DNA to everywhere, because you need to send it to everywhere where blood goes, and that's going to be relatively hard to do, because blood goes almost everywhere within the body. Um, so I'd, it could be some time before, they were, before a better DNA delivery package is designed, so you can do that. But as with most things, step changes happen every 20 or 30 years, so... 20 or 30 years? <laughs> Very good. We'll take a question from above the screen there, please. <clears throat> um, when you were talking about the universal flu vaccine, yeah. you said that the aim was to target something which is basically universal across all the different uh, strains of flu. Yeah. But um, if it feels like this would be something that's rather easier said than done, um, aren't many of these often... Uh, well, effectively, hasn't evolution identified that these are potential uh, areas where the, uh, an immune system could target it. It's not often are they like, protected or anything. Like, um, so uh, it is easier said, easier said than done. Um, so the difficult part being uh, there are certain things that are present on the surface that are easier for the immune system to detect that's why your immune system will naturally pick those over other ones. They're generally more similar to another disease, so you have less, there's a kind of less thinking for your immune system to do. Um, that's why it's hard to find a, a part that's conserved across all flu types that is also going to be easy for you, for you to use to create an immune response. Um, that, so you're, in many ways, your point is correct in that the evolution of the flu vaccine, uh, sorry, not the flu vaccine, the flu virus itself, is done so, so as to not make it easy to, for your body to fight it, and therefore not make it easy for a vaccination to be created. I think there, there are um, areas that do exist, and there is work that's been done in animals that shows that you can create a universal flu vaccine, it's just it hasn't got to a point where we can reliably make those vaccines as well as it being tested so it confers immunity within humans. Great. We have a question. Is it up here, Jane? I really liked your flat pack analogy um, for synthetic biology. Um, I was wondering what are um, a couple of examples in synthetic biology that you're excited about? Because I understand the principle and I'm excited by it as well, but I... I don't know. I want to know some specifics, some, um, some things that can be made by it at the moment or um, things that you're looking forward to being able to be made. Thanks. Things that can be made at the moment. Um, so, uh, so I guess if I think about things that we're doing in my department, um, we are something that is actually quite non-native for a bacteria, creating, creating a, a strain of uh, E. coli. Um, that will make uh, plexiglass. So it doesn't make the glass itself because it's tiny and it would be pointless, wouldn't it? But um, <laughs> it makes a, like a molecule that you can polymerize into plexiglass. Um, so that's one thing. So it's got a lot of... Obviously, we're staying away from food. Um, a lot of the work is done in kind of commodity and bulk, farm, bulk chemicals now. Um, it's probably going to be a lot of work. Uh, as I said earlier, there's the, the bacterium that was discovered a couple of years ago that can degrade plastic. Um, and generally what people do with any new discovery within a, bacteri within a bacterium is think to themselves, that's great. Uh, I don't know very much about that bacteria, but I do know a lot about, say, a yeast or E. coli. So I'm going to cut the DNA out and stick it in that and see if it will make the same stuff. And that can be done via synthetic biology. Um, but better examples are things that people are 
currently just thinking up. So creating entire pathways that will produce, uh, remove kind of, and I hate to say it because our chemical engineering brothers and sisters are our friends, but we are trying to get rid of them and um, remove kind of chemical synthesis and replace it with biochemical synthesis. So anything that can be made chemically that isn't currently made with a bacteria is something that people would be using synthetic biology to try and make within a bacteria. Cool. A question at the back here. Hi, so um, how viable do you think um, our developments in like, understanding quorum sensing are in the fight against antimicrobial resistance? Um, so we've had a lot of developments in understanding quorum sensing, but quorum sensing in, in its kind of in its um, simplest form is a very simple thing. Essentially, all you're doing is stressing a bacteria and it's sending out signals saying, I am under attack. Um, it's very dependent on the bacteria as to what it will do when that happens. Uh, so that also will have an effect on whether or not antimicrobial, uh, have, an, uh, have an impact on antimicrobial resistance. I think the general feeling is that we need to move away from um, looking at molecules that can kill bacteria because generally they're made by other bacteria who have the ability to resist that molecule. Um, and I think the, the general future may be for um, one, of the, well, one of the things that will help comp that kind of end the issues with uh, antimicrobial resistance, if it ever is ended, would be to use kind of phage therapies um, instead of anti, uh, antibiotics. I think, some, as, uh, uh, from your question, I guess you know that some things are going to be much harder to deal with than others. And quorum sensing is more of an issue for things that can talk to each other and spore form than those that have no real response to any environmental or chemical threat. Does that help? Cool. I take a uh, question from the lady uh, in, the, in the middle here, please. Uh, I'm just wondering if there are any efforts being made to replace plastic using, using your methodology and creating things from plant materials. Michael, could you repeat the question so everyone can hear, please? So the question was, uh, are there any, eff any efforts being made to replace plastics um, and replace them with uh, kind of plant-based materials? Um, so the easy answer to that is yes. Um, but there's, so as I've uh, said to one of the earlier answers to the questions, because plastics are derived from petrochemicals, um, and one of the things that we're doing is replacing lots of the chemically, derived, chemically produced things. Um, so there are already bioplastics that are relatively um, effective. Um, there will be things that are similar to plastics that have been created from plant fibres. Um, we'll grow kind of kind of cellulose type polymers within bacteria also can harvest them from plants. So there's a lot of work that goes into um, making kind of biologically derived plastics. The beauty of a bi biologically derived plastic is it's going to be easier for it to biodegrade. Um, but it doesn't always have the same properties as the plastic. So we're working, a lot of work has been done into kind of creating biologically derived plastics that have the similar properties to the plastics that we uh, kind of know and used to love, um, but now hate. <laughs> the, but yeah, the, so the easy answer is yes. Um, from many different kind of spheres, people are trying to work out the best way to replace plastics. It kind of leads on to the fact that lots of people, if you don't work within process engineering, don't realise how much is created from petrochemicals. Um, and if we were to stop using petrochemicals today, how, what the impact that would have on society would be. It wouldn't just be we'd be able to drive cars. If, it is, if, it's, if it's synthetic and it hasn't got a metal in it, it was probably made from petrol, or oil, should I say. So that's so much stuff. It's f some food additives, it's lots of clothing material, plastics, a lot of your simple, um, your kind of generic healthcare things are all derived with a starting block that has some kind of petrochemical birthplace. Uh, the gentleman up here, please. Hi. Uh, this one sort of goes back to right at the start of your talk and also picks up on a couple of the answers you've given. 
Um, given the potential that you outlined in terms of using the technology to develop fuels, in particular petrochemicals, why do you think the automotive and transport industry has gone towards sort of hybrids and electric cars rather than use some form of other medium for the internal combustion engine, which logic says the cars are already out there, they're already burning hydrocarbon, so let's go for a clean, synthetically processed, um, plant-based or bacterial-based fuel? Um, that's a good question. Um, I, uh, some, with some things, I'm quite cynical, but I'm kind of hopeful within the automotive industry that um, the reason it's been done is because they thought uh, we can do with diesel, we can do some blending of biodiesel and diesel. There isn't a natural replacement for petrol, but um, the electric car is kind of a stopgap between, unless they improve batteries and charging enough, you're always going to require some kind of liquid or gas filling system. Um, you need to be able to refuel quickly, and you can't refuel by charging over a few hours. You want to be able to stop somewhere and refuel, and and refuel or recharge in a few minutes. So unless electric gets to that point, uh, or unless we use, start to use transport in a very different way to the way we use it now, it's always going to have to be a, 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 a it's kind of going to have to be that electric is kind of a stopgap between that and the next um, fuel source, which could be um, hydrogen uh, over uh, the liquids. I think hydrogen is probably a good bet because it's not that big a step from electric to hydrogen because all you're doing is replacing a, a battery with a fuel cell. Um, as soon as the ability to create enough of it and deliver it and store it safely, and we get over the kind of societal concerns about it being explosive, um, <laughs> then uh, it, that could be the next step. And like automotive manufacturers are looking at hydrogen as a, um, as a fuel source, mostly the Japanese automotive manufacturers, but they are looking at um, hydrogen as a fuel source. Is there a question in the front? Do you have one? Can we go? So I'll use mine. Hi. Um, <laughs> found the talk really, really interesting, and especially someone coming not from the science field. It seems that the, the use, and especially in particular for the future of food, fashion, and fu fuel, is very positive. There's a very positive spin on how the microbiome can be used in order for us to live a, a better, happier, longer life as the human race. However, can you talk a little bit more about how the process that you know you would undertake in order to make things like Memphis meats, like Impossible Burger, Eco Fashion, etc., a little bit more egalitarian in terms of an economic price point? Because I do think that right now, while they're still in their nascence, are quite unaffordable by the masses. Um, good question. Uh, <laughs> I think I'm always going to put a positive spin on it because I need to work until the end of my working life. And if I don't, then um, the field could die. No. Um, so what is surprising, actually, is that some of the, especially meat products, are getting very, very close to um, what would be their meat alternative, price-wise. So I, did, I discussed the fact that you can't grow a steak in a lab but you can make an effective meat substitute for more or less the same price as meat. Um, it's going to get more and more complicated as people want more and more from their meat substitutes. So we're still looking at um, things that aren't that far derived from just making corn. And corn is just growing a fungi and then reconstituting it so it looks like meat. We're still just growing either... Um, another protein form and making it look like meat or growing uh, meat in its kind of simplest form. So Memphis Meats is the only one who does la actual lab-grown meat and they still kind of grow like ground beef-esque stuff and then have to reconstitute it. And it's probably as long as you do expect less from your meat substitute, basically, it'll probably still be okay. It's only when we start to think about the fact that people might want to have 
like a different part of a chicken that isn't just a re something that's like reconstituted chicken breast, that things might start getting more and more expensive. So yeah, I mean, currently things are a little expensive for everyone, um, but are close to the price point of real meat. Um, I'm kind of torn personally, because while I've not tried any of the meat um, uh, substitutes, but I am not a massive personal fan of meat substitutes. I just think uh, if you want to eat vegetables, you should eat vegetables. It's, a, it's just a lot easier. Trying to make those vegetables seem like meat is a bit of a weird thing to do. So, uh, Mike, Michael, I'm going to ask myself, uh, I'm going to ask a question. And I was very taken with your 3D printing uh, <laughs> idea. So, you know, the entrepreneur is going to ask, how far away is it a business that we should be looking at in all seriousness? What are the timescales we're talking about? So that's just an idea I've had, so I shouldn't have told everyone. <laughs> <laughs> no. um, I think um, the resolution for 3D printing isn't good enough. Uh, also, it's more actually not that that part isn't as important as the fact the ability to print cells is going to be very difficult. I think within a decade you'll be able to do it. So it's not going to be something you'll do next year, but I think within a decade it'll be, you'll be able to do it. Outrageously exciting. Super. <laughs> Any more questions? Uh, the lady at the front here, please. For row three. Thank you. Hi. Thank you. It's terrific, your talk. Um, following on the question about timescales, you've raised... I mean, it's massive. There's, like, new oceans of products that you've talked us through. Can you make it take some kind of stab at time frames? And what are the drivers that are, give, that are going to give us what first Ooh. of <laughs> all of those issues? Um. So the first, I think healthcare is probably going to go first. Um, so we're going, to have, we're going to make massive strides within cell and gene therapy for healthcare reasons before we do for food. Um, just be, and that's just because, the, as you said, the drivers, we don't really need to yet for food. Um, agriculture is damaging the planet, um, but... There is a section of people who don't believe that's a thing. Uh, I'm not one of those people. But until we realize the, until everyone realizes the, the real damage it's going to do, the, the driver to create alternative protein sources isn't yet there. So that's why it's still kind of a nascent area uh, in relation to cell and gene therapy, which has been kind of researched for 10 to 15 years. The meat, using it for meat, because it's so expensive when it's first started, its use for meat was kind of, um, ignored. I made a joke about not thinking it was going to be a thing, but it was most, a lot of that was about the cost. Just the sheer cost of growing a meat cell is really high. Um, so we've had to look at ways of reducing that cost, and we've done that first off with um, healthcare. Healthcare is a thing that unites us all. Um, everyone, everyone kind of wants to live forever. Uh, and we're getting closer and closer to being able to do it, unfortunately. <laughs> That's a scary thought. <laughs> is there a lady just too, too along? Yes. Do we need a mic? I'm going to throw mine at you. This is um, slightly a little off, off pharmaceuticals and medicine. My son and I were discussing. Um, is, is, is it anywhere in the future where microbes will be used to store data? Ooh. Being that they can record, that, that, this, this, this is what my son comes up. I mean, they're able to record information, um, and being that servers are taking up huge amounts of space on the planet, you yeah. would wonder whether or not microbes could be an answer as sort of a genetic material for holding data. Yeah, so I'd love to say no, but I'd probably be proved wrong, as I have been about many things as I discussed in my talk. It's actually. Um, a great idea, so I'm going to write it down. <laughs> um, I think there are natural issues um, with the ability to do it, which are, one, a single microbe doesn't last for that long, but they can reproduce. So you're then thinking about having all of your data on one microbe reproducing it, so you, you're dupl duplicating your data. The, the only real problem, as we talked about with um, everything, we actually everything, so the viruses and the microbes, is that they do change over time. And you wouldn't want your data to change over time. 
This is something that I have no idea how you could stop, but you probably could stop. Um, so it's actually a really good idea. So you, probably, you probably could do it, but you, we're, not getting, we're getting closer and closer to creating a synthetic microbe. If you, when that happens, that could probably be used for data storage. Current microbes, very difficult to do. Can I just, how old was, were you into asking the question? 14, killer questions, yeah. so fantastic. <laughs> so the scientists of tomorrow asking the most difficult questions. Yeah. Fantastic. A question at the back, please. So how do you think synthetic biology can be applied to treat diseases like malaria, which is caused by protoctus, and being a, a eukaryote is bigger than a mammalian cell? And if you say you can target a specific glycoprotein, um, due to being eukaryotic, they change frequently due to antigenic drift. And how do you think you can synthesize anything to treat that? Um, I mean, so malaria, you could attack it on many different ways, couldn't you? So you could create a vaccine for the individual. You could attack the... Um, you, could, you could attack malaria itself, but you could also maybe change... Um, Mosquitoes, uh, if you were to give mosquitoes a competitive advantage that meant they could, all, but also meant they couldn't carry um, malaria, then eventually your mosquitoes would out who couldn't carry malaria would outcompete all other mosquitoes. So there's many different ways in which you could do it. I think that's one of the beauties of synthetic biology, and one of the problems with us as a race is that what we generally do is we try stuff and then realize a little bit too late it was a terrible idea. Um, so I don't know which one would be the best, which way to attack it would be the best way to attack it. I'm going to guess, though, that attacking um, either the mosquito or the malaria itself would be a bad idea just because we don't know what will happen. Whereas if we immunize ourselves against it in some way, that would probably be the best thing to do. We have a question at the front here. Your, um, thanks for your talk. It's a really interesting subject. Um, it seems like a fascinating area of growth over the next uh, coming decades. And I wonder, um, have you thought much about who dominates funding in your field and if you trust their motives? Um, <laughs> I trust their money. <laughs> um, so uh, I guess I'm kind of hopeful that it is going to be... Uh, it's, it was, when I started it, it was a really interesting area. That's why I stayed with it. It's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And I kind of, I kind of tried to say within my talk, it's more about as we, knew, as we know new things, we get to do more new things. Um, we are, as a department, we are funded by the research councils within the, within the UK, but also sometimes funded by pharmaceutical companies. Um, I think from their perspective, so I'm talking about pharma now, um, they just want, when, it's, when they talk to us, they just want to, us to make a process better. Um, so they've already got a product. Uh, so we don't have, there's, for our, I guess from our, my perspective, there is no real, eth, there's less ethical issues. It's, it's, we're improving the process. So they can, after we've improved it, they can choose to sell it for less. They won't. Um, well, because unfortunately, markets are driven by economies and supply and demand. And you also, so you generally just price things. Um, if you're better than your competitor, you price it just a bit more. Um, but you're never going to price it for as cheap as you could because you're going to, you have shareholders who are going to be angry at that. The pharmaceutical companies are getting better though. Um, over the last five to 10 years, they've become kind of more willing to share information, uh, share data, not just with universities, but also between themselves so that they can create better uh, medicines. Um, so it, they are definitely improving, um, but their motives for um, working with us is always going to be financially driven. Whereas with the, within, with, with, within charitable foundations, with the um, Research Councils UK, or UKRI, should I say, um, you can be a little bit more blue sky. You can work on things that aren't financially driven. So we kind of do both. Um, and that, I think, is probably going to be the model for most people going forward. You need to have, you kind of need to work with pharmaceutical companies, otherwise your work is going to be a long way from having any real societal impact. 
you need to be able to do something and just demonstrate impact and show that it's improved society in some way. And you can't really do that at the scale that we within the university would work at. But you can give some of that information to a pharmaceutical company who can then do better things with it. Great. We have one question from the middle row here, please. Hi, I really like to talk, uh, but at the end you mentioned psychobiotics yep. and, I was, and how they affect mental health. And do you think that they could possibly replace like recreational drugs in the future? And do you think that if we overuse them, will they have like a counter effect on our health? That's a good question. <laughs> um, and by good, I mean hard. Um, I think... It's a very strong chance that that will happen. Uh, look, doing some of the history of uh, fermentation research for the talk, it became very clear that as soon as people found anything that was psychoactive, they would throw it in for food and drink. I think that will still happen. Um, and especially because, I mean, a lot of us are working towards democratizing knowledge, um, letting kind of and there's lots of kind of biohack spaces. Um, so people can do synthetic biology themselves. And as while it was like a, like a bit of a magical box to me, there are lots of people who are much smarter than me who could do many, many things just within their kitchen. Um, so I would think that there is a chance that when we start to understand better our, the link between our mind and our gut, people will use that link to induce states of euphoria induce hallucinogenics um, um, and create kind of psychoactive substances through um, the link between the mind and the gut. It's, I mean, to a certain extent, it currently already happens because there is a link. So your mood is massively affected by, the way, by your microbiome. It's massively affected by what you eat. So to say that it won't happen and be extended as we know more would be, I think, silly. So I think you're you are right, it probably will extend and it will be used um, recreationally. Great, we have a question right next to you and then, and then we'll take the gentleman at the back. Um, what, are, what is mi microplastic and what are the future perspectives of dealing with it and the possible long-term effects on health? Microplastics? Uh, so microplastics are just tiny pieces of plastic. Um, so for the environment, they're terrible. Um, but for me, uh, as an engineer, it's actually pretty good because what you need to be able to do is, what you need to be, think about the fact is I want to feed the plastic to a bacteria. And if I have um, a piece of plastic like this big, it's gonna the bacteria is going to struggle to digest it. Whereas if it's micronized and tiny, it's going to do uh, a much better job of breaking it down quicker. It's got a much larger surface area for um, any amount of stuff for it to work on. So, uh, so the, the effect on the environment is very dependent on the environment. Uh, so for my environments, which are within a lab and within uh, a fermenter, a microplastic is a really good thing. But as soon as you leave that lab, it's a really bad thing. And one final question from the back here, please. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for the talk. I found it very stimulating. Um, and going back to relating to you're talking about uh, the large pharmaceutical companies. Uh, there's going to be a dilemma, isn't there, if the exciting potential of personal drugs come, comes about. So the market for each individual one is going to be very much smaller. And when you consider that at the moment drugs cost about a billion pounds to, from discovery through to the market... Um, can you see the demise of the big pharmaceutical companies? Um, I'd love that, that to be the case, but I think what actually will happen is that the product will change. So instead of having a drug itself, um, they will start to monetize the creation of processes. So the process whereby, whereby which you take a T-cell from a patient, um, modify it so it can become a cancer drug, will be the thing that they will monetize rather than the cancer drug itself. So I think they have the current financial backing to do all the research within that space. As soon as it gets close to being industrialized, every time... I guess the economic world has changed slightly, whereby 
a startup used to be a startup so it could grow and become huge. So in my field, that would be someone like Amgen or Genentech. Um, but again, there's lots of fields within the tech space where they started very small and now they're kind of ubiquitous and everywhere. But now it seems to be that startups grow, uh, just grow enough that they get bought by a big company and you cash out. Um, I think, uh, is it Google Mind? DeepMind did exactly that. And because you then have money to go and have other ideas. Um, so I assume what will happen is if, if the ideas or the process by, by, whereby which new medicines are made are not made by a pharmaceutical company, and they're made by a, a, within a university or from a university spin-out or an SME, they'll just get bought by the big company who has all the money. And then they can move on and do something new. Well, Michael, this evening, um, you have indeed um, entertained and informed us, uh, as I uh, hoped that you would. It's been absolutely amazing uh, for the perambulation through the world of marvellous microorganisms and to learn about actually how they might be used for the future. But if we could thank you in our most normal way, thank you so much indeed for coming, Michael. Thank you. Thank you.